Thank you so much, Francisca, for these kind words of introduction. Thanks to the European Society of Aesthetics for having me here. It's a great honor. It's a great pleasure. Um, I know that many people have worked in the background to make this possible, but I'd like to particularly um, uh, say thanks to uh, the mastermind be behind this all, uh, Regina you know, Mion, who unfortunately cannot be here with us. Um, and this is very unfortunate, but I know that she's uh, connected from afar, and I'd like to thank her again for uh, this amazing work she, done, she has done to have us here uh, today. And of course, the European Society of Aesthetics has a connection with my own university, Fribourg, because uh, this was the place where it was initially set up uh, by Fabian Dorsch, whom I think uh, all those who have met dearly remember. So let me start. In a 2007 video installation, Venezuelan-born artist Javier Telles has re Oh, this is not working well because you have set up the automatic... No, I don't want the automatic... So, we start again. Uh, in a 2007 video installation, the Venezuelan-born artist Javier Telles has reinterpreted the famous Indian parable of the blind man and the elephant, restaging it in a park in Brooklyn, New York, where the artist currently lives. Six men come across an animal they have never encountered, and each of them touches a different part of the body and starts conceptualizing it based on what they, set, they sense. The elephant is a pillar, says the first man who touches his leg. Not at all, it's like a rope, says the second man who touches the tail. God, no, it's rather like a thick branch of tree, says the third who touches the trunk of the elephant. It's like a big fan, asserts the fourth who touches the ear of the elephant. And the fifth, touching the belly, says it's like a wall, while the sixth describes it as a pipe as he touches the tusk. The moral of this Indian parable is rather easy to grasp. And it sums up the meaning of what is usually referred to as perspectivism. Each man is caught in his single perspective and can't see the whole picture. And their lack of understanding of what perspectivism means blinds them lastingly. It requires a wise man who eventually was in the vicinity a seer to tell these blind men what they were incapable of understanding. That is, that they were all right and referring to one and the same object, but from different vantage points. Each of them holds a little piece of the truth, and that pieced all together, they combine this into a full understanding of what a, an elephant is. I would like to call this version of perspectivism additive perspectivism. And I'll explain this in a moment. Partial views can be added 
one to another, ultimately converging in a harmonious unity, which was always already given, except that humans were incapable of understanding it. What is taken to be a different thing is just a thing seen differently, and hence alterity becomes a relative matter. But the artist who often works with impaired persons or other marginal uh, social groups has added another layer to his artwork. And the title, which I uh, purposively uh, withheld so far, indicates that Javier Tellez does not only offer a reinterpretation of the old parable of the unity and diversity, but also a reflection on incommensurability. The title of the 2007 video work is Letter on the Blind for the Use of Those Who See. And of course, you will have recognized a title of a famous Diderot essay uh, of the same title. In Diderot's letter, rather than telling the blind men what they are missing, the point is to tell the seeing what they are missing in the blind man's sensorial perception. Once again, the issue of incommensurability is raised. What is tactile imagination like on the one uh, hand? What does it mean to imagine when you lack vision? And on the other, will an average visually non-impaired subject ever be able to take uh, the stance of someone whose sensorial access to the world is not mediated through the sense of sight? The incommensurability hypothesis opens up the horizon of an irreducibly different experience and the issue of how to bridge this gap if ever it can be bridged. Two ethical positions have been dithering and bickering on the question of alterity. Is the best answer of addressing the otherness of the other to develop an inclusive approach considering that variety is nothing but an expression of a more underlying unity? Or is this in fact the most insidious form of violence since it reduces otherness to sameness, given that the instance that includes is already on the safe side, asking the other into an orbit of identity which itself remains unquestioned. Defenders of an ethics of radical alterity favor a completely different approach which situates the other outside of any common ground and preserving it from the colonial lure of a hegemonic identity. However, there are sufficient ex empirical examples in the recent years that uh, uh, show that what passes off as an advocacy for singularity and difference is in fact nothing but a fig leaf for the worst form of identity politics. What was once a project of emancipation for minoritarian positions has now become a knockoff argument for silence and critique. In the name of alternative and supposedly utterly irreducible experiences, some pressure groups ask for, an introducing, for introducing alternative narrations in education and science. Creationists or negationists who don't feel represented by the supposedly hegemonic discourses of science ask that beyond Darwinian biology, other approaches to the creation of the earth uh, should be taught in school or that the events concerning genocides, which by definition are not symmetrical, should be narrated from both perspectives. For a long time, perspectivism was associated with alternative takes on things. To be able to envision to change perspectives meant to be able to consider the possibility that the matter could be different. Perspectivism sided with alternative, alternativity. After all, wasn't that the principle that Margaret Thatcher gave out in the 1980s, the famous Tina principle, there is no alternative. By now, cards seem to have been completely reshuffled Whereas the what-if question had been historically preempted by progressive politics, how would a world look like if it were to be different? Today, it looks as if it had been taken over by conspiracy theories, who of course, as we know, don't even deserve to be qualified as theories. Since then, the idea, uh, this idea towers above current public debates and might be suffice it to make a short reference to examples um, like these uh, about inventing a new concept such as alternative uh, facts, not only alternative reality, but alternative uh, facts. When Kellyanne Conway, the um, 
um, um, counselor to uh, former uh, U.S. president gave out uh, this expression. A certain number of public intellectuals uh, has blamed postmodernism for this development, and some people even claimed that the rise of fake news and general relativism was prepared by Friedrich Nietzsche, most fam famously when Nietzsche said that there are no facts, only interpretations. Perspectivism, whether in its Nietzschean or later version, would herald a philosophy of the anything goes, where everybody can celebrate their own little truth without having to confront others, and even less so, something like criteria of validity. So today, uh, in the framework of this conference, I'd like to do mainly three things. First of all, in the first step, I'd like to test whether it uh, is accurate uh, to uh, blame Friedrich Nietzsche for this relativist form of interpretationism that many see at work in the context of uh, fake news, post-truth, and alternative facts. And in this context, um, I will um, try to offer a reappraisal of what perspectivism might mean in a Nietzschean uh, framework. And I will argue that perspectivism can very well be consistent with a robust form of objectivity. Secondly, I will suggest uh, a typology of different versions of perspectivism. Actually, I suggest a typology of with three different kinds uh, or sorts of perspectivism. Um, and I will li um, outline why there are some issues with the two first canonical versions of perspectivism, and I will um, argue in favor of a third kind of perspectivism um, and in the third step, I'd like to uh, sketch out um, some of the epistemological and aesthetic implications for this third kind of uh, perspectivism, which I call the diagonal perspectivism, um, in uh, the context of the issue, what it means to share viewpoints. What does it mean to have a common viewpoint? So how to rethink uh, viewpoints as something that not only closes us off and closes individuals in their little bubbles and echo chambers, but that allows something like commonality. So I'll try to um, um, respect uh, the constraints of time, and I have to ask for your leniency if I will not uh, outline all the different subparts of my arguments uh, in the required uh, uh, detail which these different parts would require. Uh, however, um, if you're interested, uh, you uh, uh, can find the longer version in the book that uh, Francisca was so kind to mention before, Partage de la Perspective, and uh, these were actually uh, lectures I gave in Shanghai, and this book is now also coming out in there are various translations underway, and there's also a translation into um, English forthcoming. Okay. Um, so first step, why Nietzsche's perspectivism is not a relativism. There are no facts, only interpretations. You have heard this statement often. Uh, it's actually made in a posthumous fragment, um, but we find similar variations on it uh, in numerous other passages in his work, even in published passages, and um, its most systematic justification probably could be uh, found in the early essay um, Wahrheit und Lügen aus dem moralischen Sinne, Truth and Lie in an extra moral sense from 1873. Now, of course, according to the detractors of Nietzsche, uh, this statement is absolutely um, problematic, not only because he installs, it installs Nietzsche as the founding father uh, of um, relativism, postmodernism, and all the other things uh, that... Uh, um, uh, supposedly went wrong in 20th century, but also proves Nietzsche's philosophical deficiencies. 
someone who makes this kind of statement is simply a bad philosopher. Why is that? Well, of course, because the sentence, uh, there are no facts, only interpretations, is self-defeating, right? So no, uh, um, so as any general relativist statement, it must also include itself, which would mean that the fact that there are only interpretations is itself subject uh, um, um, to, to interpretation, and that, of course, um, defeats itself. But is interpretationism, for which uh, Nietzsche later, in the fragments uh, on the will to power, uses the expression perspectivism, really a form of relativism, as it's usually claimed? I guess, in my reading, um, I would uh, rather favor a differentiated approach to the Nietzschean body of, of, of work. And uh, while the early Nietzsche indeed seems to suggest a kind of general relativism, think of expressions such as uh, truth as a mobile army of uh, metaphors, which can only be overcome by a sort of artist's uh, metaphysics. So you have to come to an art school to overcome this general relativism according to the early Nietzsche artist metaphysics. Uh, the the uh, later Nietzsche evolved on this matter. And if, if uh, you read him more carefully, I think it becomes obvious uh, that this kind of very decontextualized readings, as it often happens, uh, is, is simply untenable. Uh, Nietzsche evolved on the matter, and perspectivism um, uh, starts to mean a rather different thing over time. The often quoted passage from the early work should be contrasted, for example, uh, with this one from uh, the Antichrist, when Nietzsche praises the act of the art of being, I quote, able to read facts without falsifying them through interpretations, without letting the desire to understand make you lose caution, patience, subtlety. After all, it's a philologist talking here, and he knows very well uh, how much time is required to be faithful to uh, ancient texts. I believe it's time to revise the myth according to which Nietzsche would be some sort of prophet of an unrestricted anything goes. On the contrary, Nietzsche rather stigmatizes those who believe that once the knowability of the thing in itself has become questionable, we are left with a jolly dance of whirling appearances alone. As it happens, affirming the rise of mere appearances of a society of pure spectacle is to re remain caught in a metaphysical dualism. Nietzsche openly scolds the naive and ultimately comfortable perspectivism, which affirms that each and every one has different perspectives, since, since this seemingly liberal coexistence will then ultimately lead to the most questionable unification, the fusion of horizons in an arbitrary and coercive fixed conventions. Fixed, uh, fixed convention is the term he uses in his uh, Hobbes reading. It's an absolutely fascinating and still underestimated uh, part of, of, of the Nietzschean philosophy, his own reading of, of Hobbes, where he shows that this idea of, of coexisting individuals can only be solved if you then impose uh, a, a new absolute uh, overarching order. So this is the reading he makes of the Leviathan. An ambitious perspectivism aims, aims at a different conception of truth, which is the hardest to find. Moreover, it is impossible in epistemological matters to consider Nietzsche an individualist in any common understanding of that term. His perspectivism in no way excludes the possibility of gazes crossing on the contrary. Nietzsche's dynamic and agonistic conception of perspectivism establishes the confrontation of points of view as the norm. In all these ways, Nietzsche abandons an intellectualizing conception of the subject. And I'll come to maybe the, the uh, most explicit um, presentation of this in the third essay from the genealogy of uh, morality, uh, Genealogie de Morale. From now on, my philosophical colleagues, he writes, let us be um, on guard against the dangerous old conceptual fiction that posited a pure, willing, painless, timeless, knowing subject. Let us guard against the snares of such contradictory concepts as pure reason, absolute spirituality, knowledge in itself. They always demand that we should think of an eye that is completely unthinkable, 
an eye turned in no particular direction in which the active and interpreting forces through which alone seeing becomes seeing something are supposed to be lacking. These always demand of the eye an absurdity and a nonsense. And here he adds, there is only a perspectival seeing, only a perspective knowing. The more affects we allow to speak about one thing, the more eyes, different eyes, we can use to observe one thing, the more complete will our concept of this thing, our objectivity, be. To cut a long story short, perspectivism is not a relativism, but rather the condition for a more appropriate understanding of objectivity. The more perspectives we are able to draw together, the more comprehensive our objectivity will be. Or to put this yet differently, perspective does not relativize, perspective realizes. At the same time, this plea for perspectivism comes with the caveat. Rather than preparing post-truth, Nietzsche warns us against relapses into naive metaphysics, which believe they can produce a discourse about facts disregarding their own position. While objectivity requires accepting that there are infinitely more standpoints than the own we currently hold, there is also a haughty conceit in believing that we should pretend speaking from the vantage point of others. As he puts it in a passage from uh, the Fröhliche Wissenschaft, we cannot look around our corner. It is a hopeless curiosity to want to know what other kinds of intellects and perspectives there might be. Today, we are at least far away from the ridiculous immodesty of decreeing from our angle that perspectives are permitted only from this angle. I believe thus that Nietzsche not only can be helpful to reappraise an ambitious form of perspectivism today, but also that we can uh, use him to criticize naive or shallow conceptions of it. So, there's a naive understanding of, of facts, and I think it would be the de death of intelligence today to be fighting back post-truth uh, um, uh, cynicism by defending the pure and raw facts. I call this the danger of neo-factualism, which I see in some parts of uh, the intelligentsia happening. And there's the other danger, which is simply to believe uh, that we could um, step into someone else's shoes without further ado uh, in order to have a fuller picture of what is going on. I'll come to, back to this. I'll come now to uh, my next uh, section, which I call Three Kinds of uh, Perspectivism, and I'd like to respectively uh, categorize them uh, as, as follows. I distinguish a reclusive understanding of perspectivism, an additive understanding of perspectivism, and a diagonal understanding of perspectivism. If perspectivism could appear as an agent of relativism and of single-mindedness, it was first of all because most continued to conceive it in its reclusive dimension. Each knowing subject, locked in by its respective blinders, only ever has a partial view of a thing. Not seeing what it does not see, the subject is incapable of measuring the gap. A perspective never presents itself in its partiality, but as a faithful fendering of the things as they are. At the level of an advanced telematic society, the increasing personalization of contents and the fact that in the social networks what resembles assembles contributes to consecrating, each time a little more, the opinion bubbles from which any divergent point of view is progressively eliminated. Nietzsche, as if anticipating this development we are familiar with today, described 
the subject of this kind of perspectivism as a victim of, I quote, a perspectival illusion, the illusory unity in which, as in a horizon, everything converges. So this would be the first kind of perspectivism, the reclusive uh, perspectivism, which of course uh, fuels what I would call autistic tendencies um, of a contemporary world. Joining this reclusive understanding of perspectivism, there is a second one, which I already started referring to, which I call the additive perspectivism. In the second version, perspective, still partial, can be placed end-to-end -to, -end to form a complete and viable full picture. That would then be the standard interpretation of the Indian fable of the elephant and the blind man. For the one who touches the trunk, the elephant is a drainage pipe. For the one feeling the ear, a fan. For the one lifting up the tail, a liana. For the one putting the animal's uh, patting the animal's foot, a pillar, etc. Only the wise man, the fable concludes, remember, uh, will understand that the contradictions are false. In other words, we might not yet see the profound unity that links all points of view, but in the end, there is an ultimate point of view, a godly point of view, that will allow for seeing things as they truly are. The ultimate unity can be furnished by an organizing God, or more modestly, by the nature of the thing itself. It's a kind of uh, epistemological realism here. Uh, it is this latter meaning that the tradition of hermeneutics maintains in the interpretation of texts. So, uh, um, slight polemic here with, with hermeneutics. In the 18th century, Cladenius, in his general hermeneutics, invoked an art of viewpoints, of Seepunkte, that consists in completely going around a thing, a theory, or a text once, and in capturing all its aspects. There is nothing fortuitous about Cladenius inventing, with this notion of viewpoints, a modern equivalent for the Latin word scopus, the right aim. The idea of progressive but constant approximation still informs the hermeneutic theories that succeed one another all the way to Hans Georg Gadamer. <clears throat> Although he always denied um, defending a pacifying conception of perspectivism, the image Gadamer chooses to describe successful interpretation, the fusion of horizons um, between the reader and the work, is more than eloquent on this point. Uh, in its different acceptations, Additive, pers additive perspectivism is thus more. Um, um, uh, sorry, is, additive perspectivism is, is thus only ever a perspectivism of half measures. The pluralism it features is only ever transition stage on the path towards unanimity. For Gadamer, a fusion of horizons between a historically distant point of view and that of a reader in the present implies a supra-temporal point of view that allows for harmonizing them. But the same argument, I believe, also holds for other paradigms of contemporary thinking, and I'll only take one against in a, a little polemic here, uh, Habermas's uh, deliberative ethics, in which the moment of dissension is only ever provisional before the better argument ends up uh, garnering the adhesion of everyone. Nietzsche equally highlighted the epistemological dead ends of an additive perspectivism. To posit an ultimate point of view is to adhere to the fiction of a single eye where the active and interpretive powers are to be suppressed absent but through which seeing still becomes a seeing something. So this would be the second additive perspectivism. And I believe each in its own way, reclusive perspectivism and additive uh, perspectivism concede either too little uh, to, uh, um, uh, no, they, they both concede too little to the operative powers of perspective, of perspective as an operative medium, since they end up reducing it to extrinsic principles. Too restricted in the case of the first, too naive in the second, perspectivism can only escape being reproached with relativism if it's articulated more radically. There again, Nietzsche's thinking allows for clearing the path. Every perspective is a movement, a force, a dynamis. After all, that's how the Greek described force, power, dynamis, 
And Nietzsche calls for a dynamic interpretation of the world, and we should hear in this dynamics this idea of a, of a thrust, a force. It is precisely because the points of view are not equivalent that they enter into conflict and that they permit, in the end, the establishment of a better truth. Both reclusive and additive perspectivism lead to a leveling in the case of the former, a general flattening because every point of view counts the same. In the case of the latter, uh, of the additive, a uniformity imposed on the gases from the outset by organizing principles. The confrontation of points of view is necessary. Only a conflictual and contrastive perspectivism can yield the relief all knowledge requires. The disparate enters into resonance and produces its internal differentiation even as it lets the objects emerge in a consistence of their own. Following Nietzsche and his call for dynamizing perspective, we must take the conflictual dimension seriously. Its dispute, its agon, as the Greeks would call it, is neither a limitation nor a choking of its machinery, but on the contrary names its condition its agonality generates and operates a distribution. Instead of an additive synthesis in a Kantian sense, it pertains above all to an agon that plays itself out between several competing sites. So this could be a, a small overview. The perspectival relief that emerges thus always results from a shared agonality and it is obtained through its dispute, dia ton agon. Put differently, dynamic perspective is diagonal, characterized by competing agonalities, and it is diagonal because its competing perspectives cut across sites once it is deployed in a plural dynamic. Perspectives corresponds to a perspective that is always invariably diagonal um, Sorry, against the idea that there is a single complete and true representation of the world and that the world consists of a set of objects independent of any way we might have of relating to them, diagonal perspective demands a permanent rearticulation of meaning. Each new perspective completes and at the same time relativizes the one that came before. So this is really, I'm interested in these two aspects, the diagonal and the diagonal, insisting either more on the agon or on the dia, on the through, on the medium. It's an operation that takes place. There is nothing immediate or natural. Okay, um, let me now come to some practical examples here. How does this uh, play out? In, uh, in, the, in my book, um, I, I actually devote a, a very long part of the book to the history of uh, um, perspective, so the invention of linear perspective, how it came about in uh, the Italian Renaissance, but also um, other forms of uh, perspective, so alternative perspectives, nonlinear perspective, non-central perspectives, the history of parallel perspective in a non-Western, non-European context, for example, in, uh, in India, Japan, China, um, but also the use of non-linear perspective in uh, Western, non-artistic forms of visualization, technical drawings, uh, geometry, um, architecture, military uh, um, drawings, actually, so the military perspective. So lots of lots of forms and, and conventions of, of um, um, uh, perspectival drawing uh, that uh, show us that there is no such a thing as a single perspective, but that perspective always comes about with different practices of uh, visualization that always allow to show certain things and uh, to leave out um, others. So, for example, if we come to multiple um, um, uh, multi-point uh, projections, uh, whether the one point with a um, uh, line of flight, two points, three points, or curvilinear, and then, of course, uh, axonomic um, um, 
perspective that became very important in technical drawing, but also uh, for, for uh, modernism. Uh, you know, if you think of uh, De Stael or, or, or even um, um, uh, Elisitsky in, in a Soviet uh, context uh, for the Bauhaus. So this idea that uh, we could have a perspective without perspective, which always means a perspective without a human perspective based on a certain type of uh, sensorial perception. So, so perspective in itself was associated with ma many different uh, promises. So I, I uh, go, go into this quite, quite in detail. And here is, uh, for example, the anamorphosis and uh, what uh, the tradition of pers the perspectivists in the 18th century called la perspective curieuse, uh, which uh, Baltrushaitis, um, the great uh, um, uh, art historian, uh, of uh, Baltic origin uh, described as strange um, perspectives. I, I, I will now not go into this in more detail, but come to another example which I don't, disc don't talk about in the book, and it's the example from cartography. I think it, I can also make my point uh, in, with this example. So in uh, 1569, uh, the cartographer Gerardus Mercator created a revolutionary new map based on a new type of projection, on cylindrical projection. The crucial advancement that, uh, with respect to the previous maps uh, was made here is that Mercator's projection uh, method allowed to preserve the shape of countries, the shape of the areas. And why was this crucial? Well. Um, because this allowed uh, the seafarers to use this map for navigation. And of course, this was essential uh, when it came to uh, organizing sea travel. The problem, of course, uh, is that this 16th century uh, map, uh, while respecting the, uh, um, uh, the shapes, um, heavily misrepresents uh, the world's land masses. So you cannot have it both. You cannot be faithful to the shapes and to the areas. So this, this then led um, in the, the Mercator projection to be producing maps that could be used in a certain way, for example, for navigation, but that would heavily misrepresent the sizes of certain uh, areas of the world and of others. Many other projection methods were devised in the meantime. So beyond uh, Mercator's uh, cylindrical projection, uh, here uh, there were uh, conical projection, for example, azimuthal projections, um, and many, many others, and uh, go-between solutions, um, such as the, the Gaul-Peters uh, map, for example. This is the, the map devised by, by uh, Gaul in mid-19th century, and it was then popularized by Peters in the 1970s. Um, so this map, you often find this is supposedly true representation of, of the world. And you often find this idea that uh, Mercato misrepresents, but this is how things should really be. This is the true size of, you know, Greenland shouldn't be this big as it is in Mercato maps, and this is the, the true size of things. Of course, uh, this is equally problematic as the, the previous uh, version. Uh, although it might well be that it preserves the surfaces better than Mercator, it distorts shapes. Uh, and then we could talk about a lot of other biases. Have you noticed that uh, most of our maps uh, are Atlantic-centered? So the Atlantic is the middle because supposedly it's around this, this axis that the, the, the meaningful parts of the world um, you know, organize the rest. And of course, uh, there, there are many other ways we could organize uh, maps. It doesn't have to be centered around uh, the Atlantic. So maps were devised, uh, for example, that are Pacific-centered. If, uh, if you have a look at the logo of the United Nations, do you remember? Do you have it in your, in your mind? Well, it uses an azimuthal projection, and that's very interesting because it's actually centered on the poles. So the place that is least populated to be supposedly more neutral. You'll have a look at the logo, it's interesting. Um, I'll now come to another example. Um, this is one of the earliest world maps at all, probably the earliest uh, elaborate world map that was commissioned by uh, the uh, 
uh, King Roger II, uh, Sicily, 1854, to the um, uh, cartographer Mohammed El Idrisi. Um, and this is supposedly, I learned, um, the earliest mention of uh, the place we are currently in, Tallinn. At least some historians think that um, there is a reference uh, to somewhere here, I believe, to, to uh, a city that is referenced uh, in, in, within an Arabic name, and this is supposedly the earliest mention of Tallinn. Now, other historians uh, have contested this and said this, is, this, this can't be the case, but this is uh, at least uh, uh, an early reference uh, to Estonia and to Tallinn, potentially. You might have noticed that this map is hard to read. Why is it hard to read? Because, of course, we are biased by our own reading conventions because we are used to see the north above and the south below. This makes it very hard for us to read. Probably a 12th century contemporary didn't have this problem because he wasn't used to these cartographic uh, conventions. You will find that in most modern representations, this whole map is simply reproduced the other way around. So this, it's already anticipating uh, our illegibility, the illegibility for our contemporary readers. So I think all these conventions just make us clear that projection standards, projection methods, are heavily oriented by interests, by forces, by things you want to uh, highlight, by things you are ready to leave out. And my point is to say that perspectives themselves visualize but also, also invisibilize and make invisible the very choices they make about what is mean, made visible and what is made uh, invisible. So I'll now come to um, my um, last point, the share of uh, perspective. To name the system of evidences that regulates the visible and assayable, the system that fixes both a common condition and its segmentations, Jean Concier, who unfortunately couldn't be with us uh, here in Tallinn after all, has coined the felicitous phrase of the partage du sensible, the distribution of the sensible or partitioning of the sensible. Rancière hereby insists on the arrangements made within the perceptual world that correspond to the distribution of social positions and parties, um, sifting into what is visible and what is not, of what can be heard and what cannot, of what is noise and what is speech. So I take up a number of the questions uh, Rancière uh, has opened up, even though I explore them in a somewhat different way. Uh, and I summarize this uh, on the, the general tag um, of uh, what I call the share of perspective. I start from the conviction that the operations of distributing, attributing, including, and excluding that which can appear within a certain signifying horizon cannot unfold without taking perspectives into account, which for its part cannot be grasped as a simple unified operation. So I insist on this dia. Um, of the diagonality of the per, of the per spicere. We tend to forget that when, the, the, when Boethius translated um, the optique techne of the Greeks as, um, as perspectiva, he invented the, the term, he insisted on seeing through, and the through itself, the per of the per spicere, in, uh, indicates an operation, a doing, a practical gesture. The operative dimension of all perspective, the through which, of its pers prospectiveness, of its, pers of its perspicacity, if you wish, always takes place through a first division, a first cut or clearing. The value we, we attribute to something, the share one reserves for it, is the result of a previous activity of division and of cutting up. And I find it quite interesting that uh, Old English has, has kept this. Um, the, the etymology of the word share uh, scare um, helps us to acknowledge that the cuts at stake are not merely mental operations, but it involves corporeal activities putting one hand down to action. While the Old English scare 
primarily refers to the sharing wool with a bladed tool or scissors. It could also refer to the working of the land with a plowshare, digging furrows for agriculture, but also ditches to demarcate the territory. As it appears, attributed parts and reserved shares are not only uh, a given, but the outcomes of specific actions of sharing, cutting, and distribution. The attribute properties and established priorities create a here and a there and a sometimes also a we and a they. Moreover, lines of division once drawn can be overridden by subsequent gestures of delineation making for an unstable and oftentimes conflictual field. Acknowledging the share of perspective, that is, of the role in the constitution of sense, begins with the acknowledgement of these operations that allow convergence as well as discrepancies to become visible. Rather than seeing in a perspective a more or less clear, transparent representation of a state of affairs, we would do well to see in it a dynamic matrix that organizes and delimits a vector of forces that separates and connects, in short, that contrasts. I think the contrastive event is the beginning of the birth of, of meaning. We can begin debating claims and the legitimacy in the sphere of values. We must look at the corporeal dimensions, however, of, being voiced, of them being voiced at all. Going back to the infrastructures of meaning and to the acts that institute all culture, we must describe the instance where significance is produced. What we share and how we share it depends on cuts into previously unmarked spaces. It is conditioned by the moves of cultural and social plowshares that divide the significant from the insignificant. Such techniques are unthinkable without the work of perspective. Perspective works to cut up, to furrow the visual field, and in doing so, it carves out a domain. When we trace a line in the landscape, establish cardinal points, situate ourselves in space, we are no more in an abstract isotropic geometry. Our space of meaning is a polarized one, and its topology depends on orientational techniques, front and back, up and down, left and right, an entire axial system that also informs the universe of our values and judgment. So perceptual space is neither something universal nor homogeneous. In each trajectory our gaze takes, we strengthen or weaken the perceptual norms that govern our ways of seeing by confirming or displacing them. By means of the ways in which we arrange things in space, through each line we trace, and through the manner in which we place a form on a plan, we also insensibly redraw the shares of space. And last but not least, we do not initiate our perspective. It is by means of our perspective that we may act upon the world. So each perspective offers more visibility to some things and deprives other things of it. And Leonardo da Vinci already put his finger uh, on this pictorial implications of these dimensions of perspective when he stressed the fact that objects lose clarity as they recede into the distance. And he called this aerial perspective also prospettiva dei, pentimenti, dei perdimenti, sorry, prospettiva dei perdimenti, so uh, uh, a perspective where things uh, uh, lose or, uh, uh, their clarity, a perspective of losses or perditions. It would thus be quite in vain to look for an all-inclusive perspective. However transversal it may be, any shared perspective generates its own exclusion its blind spots and dead angles. So the, 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 the consequences, I believe, for all, all those who are interested in aesthetic practices and their effects are on various levels. It begins on the fact that we, when we engage, for example, in um, a fictional artistic work, uh, we have to leave our own standpoint, enter into something that takes us aback or takes us somewhere else, maybe even enter into uh, someone else's shoes, enter into experiences, for example, in form of narrative um, fictional uh, works, and the work of imagination displaces us from the common way of doing. So the insistence on aesthetic experience as undoing implicit uh, norms, and displacing uh, perceptual habits as something that um, uh, shifts perspectives. <clears throat>
on the second level, uh, we could talk about the importance of sharing viewpoints on artworks. Um, all of those, uh, those among you who work on aesthetic judgment know that aesthetic judgment have, has to do with confronting oneself and confronting one's own beginning uh, inception of something like forming a judgment with the judgment of others. It, it has been said, Christoph Menke among others, that, that the point of aesthetic uh, judgment, uh, that, that it's a form of judgment that refuses uh, the judgment itself. So it's an act of judging that refuses the final judgment, but that takes a certain pleasure in working on the act of judging itself. And this, this judging itself that works in order to be faithful to this very paradoxical uh, object it tries to, to grasp is something that already takes place under the gaze of others. It has to confront itself, its own validity with the others. And this starts with um, the situation that is a very common situation uh, that is experiencing together an aesthetic situation, whether it is an artwork or, for example, something uh, like um, natural beauty, uh, uh, a landscape, uh, or uh, something like an artwork, uh, um, 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 uh, the audience of a play, uh, the audience uh, uh, of a musical work, so sensing together, hearing together, viewing together, uh, means that altogether from a different standpoint, we can refer to something common. We can refer to one and the same thing, which again insists on the objectivity on, of perspective, that it doesn't only encloses us in different uh, realities. And this important is crucial, of course, when it comes to testing uh, the transversality of aesthetic judgment. So I'll conclude here uh, with a last point, and I hope we'll, we'll, we can discuss this. Um, I, I, I stressed a lot this um, uh, the the the, the non-individualistic, uh, um, non-exclusive dimension of uh, of perspectives. If perspectival vision excludes uniqueness, seeing according to a point of view must account for the fact that there necessarily are other points of view. As a consequence, perspectival vision implies that other alternative visions are always possible. I think this is the one of the most. Um, straightforward and yet profound outcomes of perspectivism. So if perspectivism means that my perspective doesn't fully uh, account for what is what appears perspectively, it means other perspectives are always possible. And making space for the possibility that my perspective might not be the only one forces us to engage with the altogether different understanding of, of what uh, uh, plurality means. There are so many ways of showing that perspective is only ever declined in the plural, that there is no such thing as a, um, a right perspective, but that there are codes, standards, norms of perspective, that its pluralness itself is what endows it with consistence. It's the fact that there are different perspectives, and the different perspectives that are always perspective of something that only appears in this perspectivalness, in, um, shows us and gestures to the fact that pluralness is uh, what is at, at the core of perspectivalness. There are several possible ways of relating to what is, but above all, this relationship itself exists only in the plural. And I believe, and I'll uh, end with this, that of all the different meanings we can attribute to pluralism, this is probably the most demanding one. Thank you.